Hi everyone, I'm Maha Ghazali, a certified pay therapist and infant mental health specialist based in Beirut. I specialize in early intervention for children and teenagers utilizing attachment-based approaches and neuroscience-informed practices to foster emotional resilience and strengthen family uh, ties and bonds. And today I'm thrilled to explore the impact of educational neuroscience with Dr. Lori Desutalis and focus on how these insights can support and um, offer um, insights into trauma-informed education in the Middle East. Yes, so we were very excited to welcome Dr. Lori Desatel. It's been a very engaging interview. She presented with lots of information, and I would like to take the opportunity to introduce Dr. Lori Desatel and talk a little bit about her background for people who are not familiar with her work. So Dr. Lori Desatel, PhD, she's an, she has been an assistant professor at Butler University since 2016, where she teaches both undergraduate and graduate programs in the College of Education. Lori is also an assistant professor at Marion University for eight years, where she founded the Educational Neuroscience Symposium that has now reached thousands of educators, and it's in its the 15 years. Uh, Lori's passion is engaging her student through the social and relational neuroscience at, as it applies to education. She does this by integrating the Tire One Trauma Accommodation Applied Educational Neuroscience Framework and its learning principles and practices into her coursework at Butler. Uh, so it it has been wonderful having Dr. Desatel, don't you think so, Maha? She, really? uh, I no, but she prepared the whole presentation with, with visual presentations, and she prepared a lot of tools, practical tools to implement in our region. Um, she's an amazing, wonderful human being. I'm very excited. I can't wait to share this wonderful resource with all, all of our audience. So we're, of course, we're going to be working on translating it and then posting it through the uh, Syrian Professional Network. Um, looking forward to it. Thank you. So yeah, much. me too. And I would love if anyone's viewing this, if they can share with us their insights, any comments, whatever stood out with the, uh, for them, it would be great to hear also from them, even if this is recorded. Definitely. Thank you. Thanks. Sounds good. So hi, everyone, and welcome. It is with great pleasure that we introduce our esteemed guest for today's interview. Dr. Lori Desatel, an assistant professor at Butler University, brings a wealth of expertise in educational neuroscience. With a career spanning over a decade, Dr. Desatel has been the forefront in integrating neuroscience principles into education. She is also the visionary behind the Educational Neuroscience Symp Symposium, which has impacted thousands of educators over its 15 years history. Dr. Desatel's passion for the social and relational neuroscience shines through in her teaching and research. She is also striving strive to create trauma-informed learning environment. Her groundbreaking work has led to a creation of the Applied Educational Neuroscience Certification, a global initiative reaching hundreds of educators, counselors, clinicians, and administrators. We, un we are honored to have Dr. Desatel with us today as she continues to inspire positive change, not only in the educational world, but in the world in general. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. That was a Lovely introduction, and thank you. Thank yes. you. Yes. Dr. Mm -hmm. Delta Bell, um, I have to echo everything that Maha said. We're really uh, honored to have you with us. Your work has profoundly shaped how education of pro educators can approach classroom dynamics and students' well-being. So today, we're eager to delve into your insights on trauma-informed practices and their critical applications in the Middle East. So. First, I want us to start with a conversation for our community here uh, with a look at how your journey in educational neuroscience began. Well, I, I have to think um, about that because it all came together in different ways and in different pieces. But I really, as a young teacher many years ago, I... I really felt there was so much more than these labels and classifications that we just so quickly um, identify our students with. 
And I was teaching at the time, um, a, a, I'm a former special education teacher, I'm a former school counselor. And I just felt that our children and our youth began to identify with these labels, almost living them out, if mm -hmm. that makes sense, mm -hmm. um, with, with very little knowledge or understanding of what was happening beneath the behavior. So I think it started probably when I was in the classroom. That's low. That's, yeah. That is yeah. great. And it actually builds on one of our questions because it, at the core of why we were so, so excited of bringing this interview is to try to alleviate those labels and those um, uh, behavior description that we rush into describing our children in classrooms and how they're becoming so identified with it and how the teachers um, not doing anything about their frustration because they're sticking to those to those labels. So basically one of our questions was was uh, addressing those challenging behaviors and um, how educators in the Middle East commonly express concerns about the, those challenging behavior exhi exhibited in today's generation. Uh, categorizing them by defiance and manipulative, um, all those kind of even mental health description, like he's he's an ADHD, I can't do anything about it. Yes. So, mm -hmm. uh, how can we really address those like discipline approaches or those narrative that educator students relationship has been shaping the student educator uh, relationship, considering the impact of so much um, trauma, so much war happening, so much even the earthquake at like accumulating to those and uh, seeing them from like this is a natural consequences of all those trauma happening in our region. Well, I, so is it okay? I made I created some slides to mm -hmm. share based on the questions that no, you yeah. is that okay? Absolutely. Um, so much. Yes. Okay, so and I will address what you just said, but um, would you be able to give me permission to share? Absolutely. Let me pull these up here. Maha, if you can make Dr. Desatel a co-host, maybe she can. Sure, just one second. Thank you for the wonderful questions and while we're trying to share the script because it really, they really um, were all interrelated and so relevant. And so I think sometimes seeing images and I can actually share this um, PowerPoint with all of your educators. Oh, we would wonderful. They, Thank they you. appreciate that because I know it's a huge topic. How can we approach it in half an hour? But I think seeing the visual representation and some of your great work would uh, evoke some curiosity into approaching the, the educational uh, system in a different way. Okay. You should All be right. able to share it now. Yes, thank you. So you can see this okay. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So as we think about the behaviors that we're seeing and we think about what is beneath the behavior, I just wanna share um, some of the slides that address how we see manipulation and how we see defiance and opposition back to your question. Mm -hmm. So let me... Um, Oops, let me go back here. So thinking about, you know, being in this war-torn environment and the earthquake was not that long ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about it, it was, you know, 14 months ago, 15 months ago. And there is always a residual impact in our nervous systems. Mm -hmm. And when we think about that, we get activated or triggered by a sound, by a smell, and one of the things that as I was studying about um, the areas, I, I really was just so impressed at how so many students, in fact, there were 54,000 children that were supported in their schools from some of the research and much, much more work to be done. Absolutely. So I, I wanna take you to my class. Um, so I do teach at Butler University, but I have a course release so two days a week, I'm in the classroom. And um, and I just couldn't speak to educators properly if I were not walking the walk. Absolutely. This group of students, um, they are 11 and 12 years old. 
They are some of our roughest students in the district. Um, they carry in a lot of adversity, a lot of trauma. Um, they are loving, brilliant, and compassionate, but sometimes that gets buried. So this was yesterday when um, we celebrated my time with them and the connections, the touch points, and um, their wonderful co-teacher and I were so intentional about our procedures and routines and transitions. And it's really about getting out in front of the behaviors. Love it. One of the things that I wanna to share today is that when we think about behavior, our children feel relieved and they feel empowered when they understand their nervous system, when they learn the language of their nervous system. This is something that just even surprised me through, through the last decade as I've been sharing this work in schools is that there is a significant shift in behavior, just understanding that you're not a bad kid and that nothing's wrong with you. It feels empowering and it feels relieving. So we yesterday brought out um, the sheep brains that we've been studying because neuro, like in their neuroanatomy, they, they're very similar mm -hmm. to ours. Mm -hmm. um, so the kids love this and they take it seriously. And we call this our human laboratory as we look at the nervous system. And I want to share with all of, you know, all of the educators that we don't drop who we are when we walk into our schools and our organizations. This work is about the adult nervous system. It is about me as a new grandma, which is, you can see in the photo. It's about me as a mom. It's about me as any partner and in a relationship, I carry in my own trauma, my own adversities. And it's, it's just very important to recognize and give ourselves grace and knowing that we are not robots, we are working inside of a living system. And here, so yes, I just wanted to say one comment on what you wonderfully shared. Uh, we used to have in our educational system, a lot of um, mother figures, father figures as teachers. So they're bringing not only their um, trauma quality, but they're bringing their own personality qualities that make them build so beautifully, naturally relationship with kids who they can confine in or they can find safe. Yeah. in. So we used to have those examples all, all the time, but now the shift has been like I'm a teacher in the classroom. I act differently from what what I act in the in the in real life. So they're missing that relational aspect of being genuine to children and relating to them. So I lo I really love what you shared about like being being who we are inside the classrooms. Yes, Maha, that's so it's so significant. And the and again, I won't. I know our time is short, but the four pillars really lean in and nurture one another. And it's, you know, it's about our nervous systems as the adult. This work behavior management is about us. It's about the adult. It's centered in our nervous systems. And that is a mindset shift because none of us as educators, I believe globally, were really trained or prepared to understand how impactful our nervous systems are. And it's not always about being regulated all the time. It's about being aware of our nervous system. We can't be regulated all the time. This, the, just the accumulating events, the residual impact of the environment of your educators. Um, I, I want to not only normalize that, but I want, I want educators to understand that you know, this is, this is hard work, but it becomes much more joyful and it becomes much more relational when we tap in to our own nervous systems. And something that Maha has heard me share so often, we are the relational field for our students. This was a poem that one of our students shared with me yesterday, she wrote this. She was hospitalized 
early in the year with anxiety and was struggling with anxiety and panic disorders. And her teacher shared with me yesterday afternoon that um, since our work together as a class and learning about educational neuroscience, she has been thriving and um, she's using the practices that we've shared with the students every day. So she wrote this poem um, and I just, I, I thought it was just so, just such a manifestation of the work she's doing. Beautiful. So you, yeah, we go first, you know, educators go first. And this is, this is not adding to a teacher's plate. It is the plate. And so this work happens inside of our procedures and our routines and our transitions and our exits. And I just wanted to share this beautiful quote from Dr. Ian McGilchrist. Mm -hmm. And he shares when there is a serious jolt to the world community and landscape, much like a global pandemic or um, a, a natural disaster or war, a crisis develops alongside a turning point. Mm -hmm. And he refers to this type of event as a meaning crisis. And that's what I want to share with educators today because it really has the, the possibility of communicating a common cause and a call to bring us together, to shift perspectives and to become aware. So I, I just, I, I wanted to share that as yeah. well. Yeah. Dr. Lori, that's beautiful. I, I actually saw one of your recordings as well on the importance of awareness and how transformational it can be. And how you said it's how how do we announce ourselves to the world and how what do our students pick up and uh, from that announcement and it's really beautiful how you just highlighted that here i really believe awareness is the first step to healing and to healing the community as well and just seeing adults becoming aware it's um it's contagious to the students around us and they can pick up pick this up as well Oh, absolutely. And you said that so beautifully. And for me, when we talk about educator well-being or teacher, mental and emotional health, it it, be, it is about awareness. And, and, and once we're aware, then we can begin to look for patterns and we can begin to resource and nurture our nervous systems so that um, we can be in a co-regulatory practice with our students. And I just, I love this quote so much. And Maha, I've shown this in the polyvagal work, but we know that a child who's not embraced or even an adult who's not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Mm -hmm. And and when we talk about that, we are social, communal creatures. We cannot survive without each other. And unpredictability, which is what, um, so much of the world and so much of your part of the world has been living with and sometimes feeling isolated can wreak havoc on the developing brain tissue. Absolutely. And we, yeah, we know now that, you know, the social and emotional organ is not just about the brain. Um, it really is about the nervous system. Our bodies hold um, the contraction, the tension, the tightness, the what we know as armoring um, through, um, you know, our inability to move through that fight flight or through that shutdown. And I want educators to understand that, you know, we're shaping each other. We're shaping each other's nervous system in all moments. And when we're not aware, we just we can't we can't be intentional. Absolutely. So it's. Yeah, it's just it's it's just so critical, and and that's why it's it's really about the awareness. Um, um, may I, may yes. I say something on that point? Oh, if, please, just interrupt me. I, you know me; I just keep going. I love it. I love I, I love everything that you're sharing, and this is very critical, especially in our community, given that it is a collective community. So schools, it is it, it was considered a social event, not only for students, but for, for teachers as well. The gathering before going to classes was very important to reset that kind of nervous system. And we are people who quickly 
uh, to share intimate details. So the awareness part can come in a in a sharing kind of um, uh, way. So venting to each other, I'm kind of feeling nervous today. I'm sad. I was I left in a hurry today. I'm feeling this that can bring the awareness. So if we can complement that with the with the biological awareness, just in the simplest. Um, terminology based on the the great work that you can do i know that can can build a shift in our schools so really bringing that strong components of collective community and relying on each other to reset our nervous system before going to a classroom and maybe having that contagious effect with the with the students it's just such an important point and when you think about um what you just shared, it, we are really helping one another as the adults in the building to access our cortex. And, and when we do that together, then we feel the presence mm -hmm. of a trusted other. And oftentimes in our schools, and I don't understand always how it happens, but we work in silos. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's hard for us to ask for help. Mm -hmm. It's hard for us to um, share authentically. And maybe it's because the role of a teacher, you know, thinking about that word or an educator, a, an administrator is one that should know the answers. I don't, I don't understand that. I always ponder that and wonder about that. But I love what you just shared because when we can lean into each other, then we can get out in front of our own behaviors. There is not an algorithm or a quick fix or a solution to the the increase of behavioral challenges that mm -hmm. you're seeing in the schools. It really begins with us. And, you know, it's something that I shared in Polybagel, um, a question that we want to ask ourselves always is, is my nervous system strong enough to hold us both for a couple of minutes? You know, that's something as an educator, as a teacher, that when I see a student who's walking in dysregulated, rough, defiant, aggressive, oppositional, I have to go within. And if I'm not able to, then I have to feel safe enough and authentic enough to ask for assistance. Okay. And and I and I want this to be a norm. I want this to be ordinary moments in our schools. Um, when we get out in front of our own behaviors, we become aware of the unknown and the, and that unknown and unpredictability lessens. Mm -hmm. And then we can anticipate, you know, what's coming you know, next. And, and the beauty of our nervous system, and this is from the new manual, mm -hmm. is that our autonomic nervous system is an integrated system and it's an adaptable system. And this is what I want adults to understand is that we are, we have this amazing superpower of resetting every moment of the day, but it takes awareness and it takes intentionality. So, I, I just want to share that just as a, I know Dr. Bruce Perry and Dr. Porges have spoken with um, the region as well, but it's really important to understand that many of our students and many of our teachers live in these bottom reptilian limbic system areas. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, those are those areas that um, really are there to protect us through disconnecting us or helping us to run or fight off a stressor. So I want to say to every educator that our goal right now, and, and when we'll see discipline challenges lessen, is when we're intentional about helping ourselves and our kids access the cortex, that neocortex right here. You know, and when I walk into my fifth grade classroom, we all put our hands on our heads and we check in with each other. We say, where are we? And some of the kids will do this because they're in their amygdala. Some of the kids will put thumbs down because they're in their brainstem. And then if they're in their cortex, they, they show me by putting their hands on their forehead. And this is a slide we share with students. So I encourage educators, our students love this slide. They understand this. Mm -hmm. um, they understand that when they've got the green light, 
and that cortex is turned on, it's, it's lighting up the entire nervous system and we're able to problem solve, we're able to pause, we're able to think clearly, we can have good, strong working memory and our attention is strengthened. But when we are struggling in that fight flight or even in that shutdown, that disconnect or in polyvagal theory, we call that dorsal vagal state, we are so dysregulated and we are all about surviving and and in survival states it, we don't learn in survival states and our kids tell us the lights are off in the prefrontal cortex they can't see you know it's not turned on when it's there mm -hmm. and um and then this slide also i wanted to share with educators because when the amygdala limbic system the amygdala is our smoke detector when it's firing we feel as if we're being attacked and and we're unable to think about consequences rewards stickers um reasoning logic i mean we're just we're not able to do that Absolutely. so i want to say to are we out of time should i stop are we okay as long as you're okay more than grateful for everything that you're sharing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I just want to share, this is something that I wish I had known as a young teacher. Um, I, I just, I think, oh my gosh, how it would have changed my practice and those of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, trying to frame our students' extreme behaviors through any lens other than physiology is not a sustainable model or approach or or um, a protocol. Absolutely. I mean, it's always about our physiology, always about our physiology. And we know, deeply know that when you're only looking at the behavior, it like Dr. Mona Delahook shares, it is a signal mm -hmm. or an indicator that the nervous system is struggling. So one of the things when I go into schools and organizations and communities and work directly or through virtual, one of the things we talk about, and Maha, you know this, we talked about it in polyvagal, is looking at consequences. Because when our kids are rough, we move into survival, me, me as a teacher, and I've been there thousands of times. I wanted to kick out. I wanted to refer out. I wanted a good, strong punishment so that the behavioral will change. But what I'm learning is that that only re-traumatizes and it can actually reactivate the stress response systems when children and youth are carrying in pain yes. and trauma and adversity. Absolutely. And I feel like we're trying to manage behavior by throwing kids into the shutdown, that's when we feel satisfied with the results, but not knowing that we even further the the the, the behavior display on in their bodies. Uh, but I really want to visit back what you shared about the brains, because I was looking at that picture and thinking, will our students be uh, open to seeing those and not being um, kind of overwhelmed by the science behind it. But then I remember that in your work, you really use um, playfulness, you use play-based uh, some, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, Im Im images to make it approachable to kids. And uh, I feel like that this can be very applicable with, with kids, knowing that, we're, yes, we're going to be the science, we're going to be knowing what's behind our behaviors, and it's going to alleviate so much of the shame and the guilt they've been feeling because kids want to do well if they can, right? So this is the, the main thing, that they're not doing anything intentionally, and this is what we need to know how, and what the teachers need to know. And I was thinking, going into the classrooms and um, explaining those by play-based methods, uh, trying to make it as approachable, we're not only teaching the students, but the teachers are learning as well without us um, yes coming in a way that we're, we're going to educate you about stuff that you ordered. You're the experts in those, but you, you just need to know the science behind it. So yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful for everything. And Dr. Yeah, Lori, I, I want to add to this also um, what Maha said. Maha, you said something very important. And I remembered um, 
the collaborative problem solving by Dr. Stuart Avalon, where he says children lack the skill, not the will. If they have the skill, children want to be good. They want to be able to meet the demands of their environment. And uh, just not being able to do that is because they don't understand how to handle all of this. And I love how you say when you come in and you do that, yeah. that awareness by itself, that's a beautiful way to start the day. And then showing it through different approaches, everybody loves a story. And so linking it, linking what's going on in a form of like, kind of like a story. This is what's happening with you. These are the images. This is the brain that you got them. I mean, something that they can touch and tangible. It's beautiful. They're, I'm, def, I'm sure they're in the zone of curiosity where they want to understand themselves better. So that's that's really helpful. Thank you. Oh, thank you both so much. And I will show some of the practices in just a moment that we're using in the classroom. And then um, in the new manual that's coming out this summer, and um, then it, on the website, there are all kinds of resources for teachers to use. And I can and really, Maha, I can send some of the, you know, some of the pro, some of the templates that we talk about today as well that that mm -hmm. would be helpful. Yeah. I, and also, I, I want to share, too, a touch point. And I want teachers and administrators and social workers and counselors to really understand that you don't have to know neuroscience well. In fact, the kids love that you don't know. They love learning it with you. Yep. I mean, that's been so much fun. And, and I will say to them, they'll ask me like, you know, what is my brain doing when I'm dreaming or what happens, you know, when I pop off and I hear a buzzing in my ears and I'm like, you know, I'm not sure. So let's look at this together. I'm going to research this because we talked about what research, you know, you could Google it and let's talk about it tomorrow. Let's see what we find out. So yeah. they they really appreciate that is a touch point. That's discipline. We don't think of discipline like that. But when we are joining up with our students and we're not, you know, really, we're not just always leading the way where we, you know, identify ourselves as learners and that's powerful and that is discipline. Yes, big time. Yeah. So um, I just, I wanted to share this just a little bit. Um, there are so many definitions of trauma out there. And one of the things when I think about what's happened in Turkey and what's happened in Northwest Syria over the last 14, 15 months, and then the ongoing war, um, it's really when our bodies, our nervous systems become so overwhelmed. And I want educators to hear this. It's when sensory information is coming in too much, too fast, too soon, or maybe too late or too little. And for many of our families and communities, it's too long. It is what we then would call developmental trauma, um, you know, where it just continues. And, and so our physiology then not only turns into a state of threat, but it can stay you know, in that um, survival state. And what happens is trauma breaks apart experiences and we're left with pieces, fragments. And those are sensory pieces. So that's why I want teachers to understand. And I, I'm going to show this. I'm going to come back to this. Hold on in a minute. So I, So this is from an earthquake. And I just, as you look at this picture, it can be very triggering. Um, for many of our children, it can be triggering for adults. It can, and and I want to explain why just for a moment because our body holds the trauma, and those sensory fragments, those pieces, literally get lodged and they are not digested in the nervous system. And those are smells, those are images, those are tastes, those are sounds. And, and so many of our children will come into our classroom and someone slams a door or they smell someone's cologne or they see or they hear an ambulance siren outside the window or there's a pop. And we don't always know and we can't always know their triggers or their act activators. But oftentimes, if not most times, that we get we see an image 
or a smell and it throws us. And so we run out of the classroom. We might throw a chair. Mm -hmm. um, we might have foul language. We might stand up and shove someone. And I'm not excusing behavior, but we have to understand that those fragmented pieces, they, they don't have a story. They don't have a narrative. Um, and, and so that's why what we call learning the language of the nervous system is so important along with drawing, coloring, play, rhythm, predictability, creating. I heard Dr. Bruce Pear, I mean, he says this all the time, creating rituals and routines that create predictability. I can't emphasize that enough in the classroom. And what's often being punished, and we don't mean to as teachers, but oftentimes what looks like def defiance and manipulation is what we call trauma logic. Absolutely. And that trauma logic can be a student's protective and survival instinct. And punishing these only reinforces them. So we get more of it. So if we're using traditional, if we're kicking out, if we're suspending, if we're sending to the office, if we're using traditional punitive practices, that is saying to a child, this is, you know, this is what, this is what happens and this is going to happen every single time. So it becomes, you know, they begin to expect that. And sometimes there is certainty in familiarity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is, I, I think about that a lot. And so I, I wrote in one for um, students you know, and thinking about what does trauma logic look like for a teacher? So it's logical to not trust adults at school. If every adult in your developing years has mistreated or neglected your biological needs, mm -hmm. not ever, we're not talking about intention, but if that's been a part of your environment, mm -hmm. it's logical to run from a space where you hear or feel a vibration or loud noise or smells that are similar to the time of the traumatic event. It's logical to yell, fight, and defend yourself if your perceived survival's at stake. So, and it's logical to appease adults and say what you think they want to hear in hopes you'll be left alone. This is so valid. So, so powerful, yeah. honestly, yeah. You know, Dr. Lori here in Beirut as well, I mean, the entire region has been through a lot of things, but I think it's also, so there's uh, this constant uh, fear of unpredictability. It can yeah. be economic. It can be war. It can be like we had the Beirut port uh, explosion, and then we had we also had COVID. It was so many things, and then economically, so like much. shut down. And expecting students to come back, even to structure and predictability to finish a program, was something very hard to accomplish. And I understand that teachers want to get things done, um, but students are not there yet some of the students are not there yet um uh, so yeah prioritizing the trauma curriculum logic. yeah prioritizing curriculum over the relationship with the students and making sure that they go gradually to safety and that the only aspect that we're relying on in our region is the relational safety since everything else is so uncontrollable so if we can offer yes. just one teacher that's gonna smile at them at the 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 door of their classroom would be so transformational to them it's so true and and I just, I want to go back here because I skipped over this and I'll send, like I said, your, your staff will have, I'll send these to all, I mean, to you so you can share them. But this is what you just said, Maha, is that, you know, there's been so much trauma that is unpredictable and ongoing that if we cannot, and this is Dr. Bruce Perry's slide, if we cannot reach the cortex, then we don't learn. It doesn't matter what type of curriculum you're presenting or um, you're a master educator or that you're you have to continually assess and test. If our kids aren't here, then it's they they are not learning. And then we label them as, you know, cognitively impaired or, you know, we we say we talk about deficits, you know, we talk about disturbance. And, and those labels are so, they're so wrong.
for so many reasons, because our students are brilliant, but they can't get here. And to get here, we've got to feel safe and we have to feel felt. We have to feel safe and we have to feel felt. And that's true for our educators as well. We cannot address the learning loss until we address that social and emotional loss that so many of our students are experiencing. And you, one of you said this, or both of you, we know this research, it's, it's, it's so, um, it's steeped in rich literature. And that is kids in stress create in adults their feelings. And if we're not trained, we mirror that behavior. And I, I've done that as a mom. Like I have been 12 years old when Andrew was 12 years old. I've done that as a teacher. I mean, you know, that's in so, but positive emotions are contagious as well. I'll send this um, graphic. Um, and Maha, I think you have this. This is a great way for a building, a staff to lean into each other and to ask questions during um, a professional learning community, during a staff meeting, during a grade level meeting where we can check in with each other. You know, how are we doing? And when we think about what our children and youth and what we need right now, we need felt safety and connection. And when that is seated, then learning happens. Absolutely. I mean, it literally happens. Absolutely, yeah. There's so much to unpack over there. And I'm more than excited to start implementing those in our region. And I know there's a lot of great um, people who are who are motivated to kind of change how we approach those situations and be there for the student, not against them. So I'm thinking this is mm -hmm. going to be so enlightening to know. And it's going to be building so much background to go and implement all the, the, the tools, the practical tools that you generally share with us and you keep uh, offering through your website and through the manual. I'm so excited to start reading that and benefiting from it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. so much. I I'm, so, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Um, so I, I'll just share a couple more if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, so you had asked in one of your questions about the power of touch points. Yes. And um, we know and I, this is something that I sometimes forget the power of validation, but when we are heard and seen and felt, our biology shifts. Yes. I mean, it really is miraculous. Our nervous system becomes much more flexible. Um, our nervous system becomes adaptable because that is when we feel and again, I'm going to say this, when we vibe with somebody, when we feel seen and heard, um, there is, it, it lights us up yes. and it literally lights up regions in the brain and the nervous system moves into a state of relaxed, focused attention. So validation, I thought I did really well, but I'm not very good at it. I I, I was surprised when I went through this the, these exercises because it really is not about praising or encouraging and it's not always following up with a question it's mirroring feelings what you hear and then stopping so as a teacher if a child comes to me and they say that is just so unfair and mm -hmm. i might say mm -hmm. i can't imagine how awful that feels to you this morning mm -hmm. and i stop and i don't no. say anything more Wow, that's amazing. Uh, reflecting back, it's exactly the, the term that we use also in play therapy to help children understand themselves and the things and experiences they're trying to process. So exactly just validating what they're going through and reflecting that back to them. Yes. Like, wow, they see me, they understand what's going on. Maybe they don't uh, accept it fully, but they really see what's going on and they understand it. Absolutely. Yeah. I yeah, I love that how you said reflecting back to them, um, because you're right, that is, it's listening for the feeling, for the sensation, but you're right, it's also reflecting back so that, you know, we can become that healthy mirror. Um, and and when when we're hearing them in a strong way, they'll tell, they will share more. But but I laugh because if if I'm wrong, they'll share more too. They're just not so happy with me. You know, so, I mean, it's, 
you know, it's both, but it's really powerful. And then as we begin to access the cortex, the power of questions are, they're just, it, they're, they're just so um, significant. And, and it also helps our students, again, to feel like they're a part of the solution and not the problem. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about the power of questions, I will say to a child, help me to understand, you know, what am I not getting? What am mm -hmm. I not understanding? Or what mm -hmm. am I missing? Um, I just feel like I, 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 I want to sit beside you, but I'm not sure how. Mm -hmm. And um, and they really appreciate that. Or oftentimes there is another adult in the building that they trust. It's not always us. Mm -hmm. You know, it might be somebody else. So we have to really identify the adults in a school for our children that need um, some co-regulation. You know, they need and, and again, it's not always me. I wish it were me, mm -hmm. but it's not always me. I'm not the I'm not the go to for all the students. And, and so that's, it's really powerful for us to understand if we can get out in front of that, then our students, if we can just literally, um, we talked about creating these um, eco maps where we put a student's name in the center and then we have all of the places and the people around the student with a strong line, a dotted line, or a very broken line that show from a student's perspective, who are the people that I trust? Where are the spaces in this building that feel safe to me? What still feels shaky? That's the dotted line. And this is in the new manual too. And then what are the toxic relationships in this child's life? You know, mm -hmm. where are the gaps? Or let's not say toxic, maybe stressful. Yes. Um, you know, but there are places that don't feel good to a student, it could be a bathroom in the school. It could be a certain hallway. It could be the office area. And once we get out in front of that, then we can begin to see those patterns. And, and it's just, those are, those are the ways, that's discipline. I cannot emphasize that enough. You know, it's being preventative, it's being relational, and it's getting out in front of those negative behaviors. And we're not gonna get out in front of all of them. Mm -hmm. But when we are intentional, we can do that. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I just, so again, behavior management centers on the adult nervous system. Mm -hmm. And this is a poster that um, we're going to be sharing in the new manual where educators can identify their sensations and their feelings. And this could be hung in a workroom. You know, we want to really celebrate how our nervous system is always trying to protect us. And then we have a poster for the adolescents. So, and our kids relate to this. Um, you know, they, I mean, they see themselves, you know, in these, um, this is obviously um, the state of fight flight um, in the center. And then we have that state of social engagement to the left. And then over to the right is that overwhelm that disconnect and shut down. And then for our, our little ones, and we use images, there's, you know, in pictures, and they can identify through the student polyvagal chart. So this one is new, it's going to be in the manual. But these when you can identify where you are all day long, then you begin to feel relieved. And I love what Dan Siegel says, you know, he says, he said it for decades, you know, what you can name, you can tame, what shareable is bearable. And it's true when you can take something that's really like inside of you and put it in a self container outside of you, just this nice, it's contained. It just feels so good. I did that in the middle of the night last night and I, and I'll share that I was struggling. I am getting like I wake up at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and there's just a lot going on, and I'll just feel overwhelmed, and my heart beats fast. And last night, I just I've been I haven't been walking the walk. I'm not doing what I'm sharing with you two this morning. So mm -hmm. last night I sat up in bed, and I literally thought, Lori, what are you feeling in your? What is that sensation? And I wrote it on this this morning. 
-hmm. I literally grabbed this from downstairs and I wrote that I felt a sharp ache, kind of a sting. I couldn't get my breath. So I started taking deep breaths. I laid back down. I tapped a little bit on those acupuncture points and I went back to sleep. It was, I said, it was just miraculous. Okay. So it's, it really is about all of us, right? It's about all of us. I really the state. Love, yeah, I really love that. And I love how critical, how brilliant it is to build those vocabularies and those awareness when the students are regulated enough to think about like the echo um, map and think of resources. Yeah. And then utilizing it whenever they're feeling emotional because all of those memories, all of those thoughts are not readily, um, uh, they're not accessible to us. But if we practice on them enough when, when, when we're feeling regulated enough, then we can access them more. And this is where the awareness part, and I'm beyond excited to start working on the same posters, but in Arabic language, because... I know yes. more generation, they have so many terminology that we're not really familiar with, but the, it has so much sense to them and they use it, use them between each other. So it's going to even be more relatable to them. So if we can start implementing that into their daily lives, then it can be more accessible to them during those heightened moments of uh, hypervigilant or emotional or even shut down. They can still access yeah. those resources. I love you that. know, Dr. Lori, there's something uh, you said here when things, when children are upset and you tell them, um, tell me what's going on, or you show them a visual. Um, I've also noticed like when I say, show me, show me what happened. And they start acting out like this feeling because they can't put it into words. And then we say, oh, you, something was um, maybe um, scary or something. And they're like, yes. And they're happy. And yes. so when you give them this, all of that, the things that you created, um, the map and the chart, you give them this sense of ownership over themselves, over feelings that sometimes are too complicated, but now they have the sense of ownership that they can, you know, directly show you or just point at it without having to explain too much what's going on. That's so, so true. And I love that. Show me, show me, you know, not tell me, show me. Um, and, and that's, that's where I even asked my nervous system last night, show me, like, what is this? I'm not going to run from it. I'm going to sit with it. Because if I sit with it, then I know it will lessen. And um, that's, it's just, it's, and I, and I love that, again, this is an opportunity for teachers to share with students authentically. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to spill out your whole life, mm -hmm. but there are moments where they're teaching moments where, you know, we can share something that's happened to us that feels, you know, like relevant and, and our kids can relate to that. So this is, and you know what, I can send you, so the manual is going, it's at the, it's with the publisher going through developmental editing and copyright and format editing, but I could send you the Google doc Maha. And if you want to start translating um, you know, some of it, I, mean, I could send that to you because it's the first edits are finished. Alan, who's my editor at Edutopia, he went through. So we're finished with that. We finished last week. So I can send that ahead of time so that you could be, um, you know, translating anything, you know, just like in chunks, anything that feels relevant to your practice, to the kids, to the schools, we can begin to translate that. Thank you. That'd be more great. Yeah. Thank you. So oh, much. yeah. No, I would. I would love that. And these are. This is the sensations are the language of the nervous system. These are physicalized emotions. So hot, empty, growly, bubbly, um, steady, flat, stuck. All, like this is what our kids get, and this is what I understand too. Um, because it really helps us to identify what's at the root of our dysregulation. And like, these are our kids' drawings, like they drew tired and this is discipline. Mm -hmm. This is discipline. Mm -hmm. they, when we use colors and shapes and lines, um, the, and I know Maha, you've seen these when I shared in class, but I love this one fuzzy. I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling fuzzy, like a staticky TV. Um, 
this is, so in the new manual, the kids are introduced to the nervous system and then they can share, what do you think this nervous system right here is experiencing? You know, mm -hmm. and once they learn the different states, the autonomic nervous system states, and they can see like they can see the colors and the lines, then they can begin to identify not just a behavior, but like this student right here, if this were a student, I think they're feeling really, really disconnected. They're numb, they're icy, they're cold, um, their their brain is showing survival. Um, you know, there's just a lot of, and then kids can write emotions on there, but this is, this is in the new manual. And another practice I want to share with your teachers is these are the conversations with my nervous system. So we know that our, so, you know, most of the language, most of what lands, lands in the body, and then is communicated up to the brain. So that, and then the brain is communicating back down to the body. So these are like thought bubbles. So like the first one, you know, I feel clammy. So my body says I'm clammy and it tells the brain I'm clammy. So the brain talks to the body and says, well, maybe a loud sigh, um, maybe crunching on something. Um, maybe I can't even read without my or splashing cold water on my face. So then we give the kids blank ones and the teachers. This is what we do with staff. This is as much for adults as it is for students. I love this. So what is your body? Yeah. I just wanted to say that sometimes the brain can create those uh, misleading narratives about what's going on in the body. So really disconnecting the judgment out of it. Like I'm feeling crumbly just because my friend is not being nice to me today. And is it really about your friend or is it because you didn't have a snack today or maybe you need the sigh or need yes. to stretch a little bit. So maybe maybe just disconnecting whatever narratives that the brain can like the unhelping narratives from what's going on in the body and just look at from a uh, non-judgmental way. Like, okay, this is my body, how it's feeling because it's trying to protect me and this is how I'm going to bring it back to safety. I love that. I love that. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we like we tell our kids is that when you have an itch, you scratch it. When you're mm -hmm. hungry, you eat. Um, if you're, if you're feeling stiff, you stretch or you stand up. I mean, there are things like we do this all the time and our body is sending those afferent projections up to the brain. That's like 80% and, and those efferent are coming back down 20%. So, I mean, really it is how we're experiencing our external environment, our internal environment, and then the relational environment. So these are just some of the examples. Um, and then, you know, teachers can always make their own. Um, you could do this at a staff meeting. And then neuroception is what Dr. Poor just talked about. This is our autonomic intuition. So we created a neuroception tracker for the kids in school. And you could do this in your office, you know, when you've got clients, when you're working with families. In, in the, my fifth graders yesterday told my husband, Michael, all about neuroception. He went with me to, he had never been to the classroom. So I said, Michael, you should come. And um, and so he just sat back and they. I asked the kids to share some of the things they've learned over the last four months. And this was a big hot topic. They mm -hmm. love neuroception. Wow. So, yeah, this is this is like and I can send the templates for this. It's a little bit different in the manual. We're comparing neuroception not to volume, but we're comparing it to radar, which I love both. But um, my publisher wanted to do he liked the radar analogy. So it's just like what time, you know, like, where are you? What time is it when you're, you know, when you're feeling, um, you know, a bit off? you know, who are you with? What are you doing when you're feeling like overwhelmed or you're feeling safe? So it helps them to identify. And this is great perceptual data for teachers. Um, this is really important data. So this is, I'm at the end. This is in the new manual too. And I just want to share with all the educators that discipline is accessing the cortex. 
You know, we've got to be able through our procedures and our routines and our transitions and our rituals to access the cortex and, 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 and really to join up with our students. It's what the first 10 minutes of the class look like. What are the last 10 minutes of class? How are we transitioning with our students? Um, I can walk down a hallway and I can pick up the vibe, the neuroception, the, the feelings and w- walking into a classroom. And so are we being intentional about um, that felt safety and creating a culture of felt safety where we're being equitable, where we are prioritizing social and emotional, the neuroeducational health of our children and adults? And are we as a school focusing on the adult nervous system? Because that's really the first step. That's discipline. It's the it's about the adult nervous system. Definitely, definitely. Are we focusing on the adults' nervous system, taking care of our teachers, so we can really start changing those uh, systems and in educational institutions? I I can't say thank you enough, Doctor Desatel. Um, beyond oh, thank you. all the resources, uh, I come always like I've been here in the United States for almost seven years, but my passion always connecting was to connect resources to our region because they're lacking so much resources, and I feel like we can utilize so much of what we have, the innate wisdom of collective community and being connected to our body again. So we won't lose that based on the science that you make it so accessible and so understandable, the complex, complex science of the brain and the nervous system, you make it so approachable. So I, I mm. really, it was an honor. I can't thank you enough for, on my thank behalf, on the behalf of all the Syrian Lebanese, everyone in our region that's going to benefit greatly from those resources and insights. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know. Oh. How, yeah. Sorry, I got disconnected for some reason. I just came back. Yes. I really want to thank you also. I mean, all the questions, you answered them so beautifully. Your work is not only enlightening, but it's truly really transformative for you know, the educators and all those committed to nurturing resilient learners. So it's been a privilege to discuss this topic with you. And thank you again for your time and for all the difference that you're making in the world of education. Definitely. Yeah, it's it's just my honor. Yeah, it's just my honor. And 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 Maha, if you'll email me, then um, I'll send I'll have Gabby. We'll you know, we can send resources to and then the website um, yeah, we'll is available, that. too. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank we'll you so much. The resources in the description. Thank you. Have a very good rest of your day, Dr. OK, Desi. OK, you too. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.